My name is Howard Watt. John Archer and I would like to thank everyone for joining me today. I'll be speaking about innovative high trace density survey design for broadband seismic data acquisition, insights and lessons learned for Symphony distributed source arrays. Just over a year ago, I was asked if I could review some of the newer methods we've used to acquire seismic data, the motivations for such methods and how they were applied. Today, I'm primarily gonna focus on a method using distributed source arrays. In an effort to gain a better understanding of the reservoir, I think we can all agree on the technical challenges that have motivated the industry to adopt newer methods of acquiring seismic data. But there are additional challenges. In many areas, increased regulatory conditions are forcing companies to adjust their seismic data acquisition plans. Cultural, archeological, and environmental regulations are restricting access to areas. Can you gain access? If so, how and how much of the area can you access? There can be limitations on the timing, in many cases, when you can access and for how long. All of these conditions can certainly affect the quality of the data and ultimately the cost of the survey. I saw a presentation a number of years ago that referenced the term more, and this seems very appropriate for what's happening with land seismic data acquisition these days. The increased availability of cableless recording systems has enabled design geophysicists to have an increased flexibility towards field operations. More recording channels, more fleets of vibrators, more source and receiver stations, more recorded offsets, and more bandwidth. The only thing that doesn't seem to apply to this trend, you probably guessed it, is more budget. So one of the more items is bandwidth. Now the importance of, and the reasons why we would acquire broadband data are well documented in the literature. Image quality, signal penetration at depth, inversion to name a few. Now given the Earth's penchant for filtering the higher frequencies of our spectrum, and the fact that we would like to increase the number of octaves of the data set to sharpen the wavelet, the trend is to spend more time in the lower frequency band. If we look at the graph on the left-hand side of the slide, we can see two items that could limit vibrator performance at low frequencies, mass displacement and fluid flow limits. Now I'm not going to dwell, forgive the pun, on the details of the mechanics of a vibrator, but suffice to say, if we desire low frequency broadband data and would like to maintain a flat spectrum, mechanical limitations of the vibrator may require that we reduce the drive level. Now what does this mean? If we look at the graph on the right, we see a sweep time compensation curve with the drive level shown on the horizontal axis and the time to achieve energy compared to 100% drive level on the vertical axis. You can see here that if we reduce the drive level to 50%, we must increase the sweep time by a factor of four. This could have serious financial repercussions with respect to our seismic budget. So how can we address this increase in sweep time while considering our budget? We'll look at three examples utilizing our symphony technique or a distributed source array method for reducing source and or receiver effort by optimizing the spatial sampling requirements for different sectors of the signal bandwidth. For our current examples, this typically leads to a reduction in the number of expensive sources, the longer broadband sweeps, or potentially dipole dynamite shots, with the ultimate goal of acquiring broadband data at a comparable cost to conventional acquisition. On this slide, we show a graphical representation of the sampling of a project by frequency, with sampling on the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis. For this example, we've broken the spectrum into three parts, the ultra lows, the lows and mid lows, and the mids and highs. The red curve shows an example of what we would consider a conventional design. The important item to note is that with these types of geometries, we've oversampled the lows and mid frequencies and historically never attempt to acquire the ultra lows at all. The data set we would really like to acquire is shown by the blue curve. But how do we do this in a cost-effective manner? With the symphony method, we redistribute the oversampled effort as shown in the shaded area to the ultra lows. Let's look at this another way. This diagram will help us later on in the presentation. In the 3D design process, we look at a number of factors, one of which is the spatial sampling equation shown here. The grid shown is the source and receiver spacing and layout for a desired high frequency of 80 Hertz. The sources are represented in red and the receivers are represented in blue. We can think of these as the equivalent of tweeters. Now, if we only wanted to acquire the very low frequencies, say up to 10 Hertz, the intervals could be opened up by a factor of eight. These are represented by the X's on the grid. Think of this as your subwoofers. This is significant because the subwoofer is by far the most expensive element in the system. This is the equivalent to the very long, low dwell vibra size sweeps or the deep hole dynamite charges. We can ultimately save a lot of effort and cost by not having to use a subwoofer at every tweeter location. Our first example is a 2D test line near the Texas-Mexico border just southwest of San Antonio. 
The base parameters have a receiver interval of 5 meters, a source interval of 10 meters, using a fleet of four vibrators shaking an 8 to 100 hertz 18 second sweep. The diagram on the left is basically a schematic of what we've coined the symphony score, with the corresponding amplitude spectrums of the different sweeps displayed on the diagram on the right. The score shows a sequence of eight VPs broken into, in this case, four different frequency bands. Each note represents a single source or vibrator point location, and the spacing between each point is arranged such that the spatial sampling requirements for each frequency band is met. Simply put, we don't need to acquire low frequencies at each source location, so better to spend our money elsewhere. As mentioned on the previous slide, the customer's reference sweep was an 18 second 8 to 100 hertz sweep, which gives us 3.64 octaves of bandwidth. Our goal is to create a symphony score that improves the number of swept octaves, but doesn't significantly increase the operational time. With a goal of 6 octaves of bandwidth, we utilize a base or ultra low sweep starting at 1.5 hertz through 100 hertz, or the end frequency of the original customer project sweep. Now, keeping in mind our earlier discussion on vibrator limitations, we'll have to reduce the drive level at the very low frequencies, which results in an increased sweep length that is double the original sweep, or 36 seconds. We've also partitioned the score into mid and high ranges, maintaining the output of the linear part of the sweep, keeping the rate of change of frequency similar for each band. At the bottom of the diagram on the left, you can see the musical instrument representation of the score. We have a single 36 second, 1.5 to 100 hertz sweep represented by the bass, a single 18 second 8 to 100 hertz sweep represented by the cello, two 16 second 20 to 100 hertz sweeps represented by the violas, and then finally four 12 second 40 to 100 hertz sweeps represented by the violins. So remember that the goal of the method is to allow us to acquire broadband seismic data at a comparable cost to a conventional data set. On this slide, we'll look at the sweep effort comparisons for three cases. Acquiring the 2D line utilizing the customer's original 18 second, 8 to 100 hertz sweep. Then again, using a full broadband solution or shaking the entire line with a 36 second, 1.5 to 100 hertz sweep. And then a third time with the Symphony broadband solution. This utilizes the score from the previous slide. Looking at the top of the diagram on the left or the conventional sweep score, we see that a sequence of eight VPs takes a total of 144 seconds. Subsequently, utilizing the full broadband solution, moving from 3.64 octaves to 6 octaves of bandwidth, we have a total sweep time of 288 seconds. This is obvious as each sweep has increased from 18 seconds to 36 seconds. And then finally, the symphony score, which only takes 134 seconds. As mentioned earlier, our goal is to redistribute time from the oversampled part of the traditional design to compensate for the increased effort at the very low frequencies. If we compare the symphony score to the conventional acquisition design, we gain over 2.3 octaves of bandwidth, but we have an increase in efficiency of about 7%. If we compare this to the full broadband solution, we have the same bandwidth, but it takes less than half the sweep time. This begs the question, is there an improvement in bandwidth and data quality? Here we have the results of our proof of concept test. In the interest of time, I'll only show the comparison of the broadband portion of the test. On the left, we show the data from the full broadband acquisition, where each source point was acquired with a 36 second, one and a half to 100 hertz sweep. It took a total of 19 hours to acquire. On the right side, we have the Symphony broadband solution. This was acquired using the score shown on the previous slides. The important item to note is that the Symphony acquisition took less than half the amount of time to complete, or 8.9 hours, versus the 19 hours of the full broadband solution. Looking at the two images, there's no noticeable difference. In fact, on some of the additional work we've done with the data, we've noticed that the Symphony dataset appears to have a slightly higher frequency content. We've postulated that this could be due to the fact that the low frequency broadband sweeps tend to introduce more ground roll, and this could potentially occur at each source location. In an effort to mitigate this noise during processing, we might actually be compromising some of the higher frequencies of the dataset. With the Symphony solution, more than half of the sweeps tend to have little or no ground roll, so this seems to be a reasonable explanation. Our second example is the 348 square kilometer spondylus project, recorded for Beach Energy in the Cooper Aramanga Basin in East Central Australia. The outline is shown in blue. This area is complicated by several environmental, operational, and geologic impediments. The project's multiple target zones pose some significant design challenges. While correct imaging and mapping of the velocity variations in the overlying Cretaceous section requires sufficient sampling and fold at relatively short offsets, 
Imaging the deep basement responsible for the depositional environment requires full long offset data. Additionally, interbedded coals act as a stratigraphic filter, which can limit useful bandwidth deeper in the section. Meanwhile, small shallow structural closures can be hidden by statics issues, and as such, require shallow high frequency data. The design parameter challenge. On the right, you can see a review of some of the items discussed on the previous slide. The left side summarizes both the original plan survey and the acquired symphony project. A number of surveys have been conducted in the surrounding area, and with the exception of one high density project, trace densities range from the tens of thousands to the low hundreds of thousands per square kilometer, with bandwidths of three to four octaves. The initial design proposal, as shown in the second column of the table, had a trace density of approximately 140,000 traces per square kilometer and just over four octaves of bandwidth. As mentioned previously, the key to increasing trace density and bandwidth without incurring additional cost is the redistribution of acquisition effort combined with operational efficiencies. With respect to the potential environmental complications mentioned on the first slide of this section, a decision was made to increase the line spacing from 320 to 390 meters. This resulted in significant savings with respect to line preparation costs. This included the cultural heritage work required to discover and protect anthropological artifacts. In turn, we reduced the source interval from 40 meters to 30 meters and the receiver interval from 40 meters to 15 meters. The increased receiver density was facilitated by the use of a truly cableless recording system with an internal high performance geophone. Finally, the crew was configured with 20,000 recording channels, resulting in an increase in recorded offsets from around 2,250 meters to 3,500 meters, allowing for improved imaging of the deep basement structure. In addition to the increased recorded offsets, the symphony design resulted in an increased trace density from 140,000 to 800,000 traces per square kilometer, and an increase in bandwidth of approximately two octaves. The symphony score. As mentioned, the plan survey covered four octaves of bandwidth. The revised symphony design increases this to six. As with the first test, test example, we can see that four sweeps comprise the eight note or eight VP score, a single 15 second 1.5 to 96 hertz sweep, a single 10 second 5 to 96 hertz sweep, two eight second 20 to 96 hertz sweeps, and four six second 40 to 96 hertz sweeps. The VPs are spaced at 30 meters, as opposed to the original design consideration of 40 meters. At the bottom of the slide, you can see a comparison of the sweep effort per linear kilometer. The symphony score is approximately 10% shorter as compared to the planned or conventional acquisition, whereas a full broadband sweep at each VP would increase the acquisition time by 50% over the conventional design. So from a data perspective, what does this look like? At the start of the 3D, we acquired a 2D test line to compare the conventional sweep against the symphony sweeps. All other acquisition parameters, including the total source time per kilometer, were identical. Here we have a fast track stack comparing the conventional 5 to 96 hertz data set against the symphony 1.5 to 96 hertz data acquisition. The improvements of the increased bandwidth from the symphony score are evident when comparing the images. Continuing with the theme of the previous slide, this set of five slides will show a data example from the 3D illustrating the benefits of increased bandwidth on the image. Here we have a raw PSTM display that shows an image created from the data generated by sweep number four, or the six second 40 to 96 hertz sweep. This is a bandwidth slightly greater than one octave. The following set of slides will show the summation of the individual sweep bands. The bottom of each slide shows the total number of swept octaves. Here we see the combination of sweep three and four, or the resulting total bandwidth of 20 to 96 hertz, which is slightly over two octaves. Here we see the combination of sweeps two, three, and four, or the resulting total bandwidth of five to 96 hertz, which is slightly over four octaves. One should note that this is the same bandwidth as the original planned conventional acquisition. And finally, the full symphony broadband solution, 1.5 to 96 hertz, or six octaves of bandwidth. Here we see a side-by-side -side comparison of the bandwidth of the original plan survey, 5 to 96 hertz, and a six octave, 1.5 to 96 hertz symphony acquisition. 
As expected, we can see improved detail and sharpness with the increase in bandwidth. Our last example is from a distributed source array test in the Permian Basin of West Texas, but with a twist, Symphony Accordion. It was a pilot for a potential 4D monitoring project, with the original baseline being recorded in the 1990s. We utilized the same source and receiver lines and then adjusted the group intervals in such a manner as to improve sampling where a subset of the new grid would coincide with the original acquisition geometry. The original source interval was 220 feet using four vibrators shaking eight eight second sweeps from 10 to 120 hertz. This resulted in a per point acquisition time of 125 seconds per VP. For the symphony source grid, we continued the concept of tighter intervals acquiring 10 VPs over 220 feet with a slightly different vibrator configuration. This resulted in an acquisition time of 138 seconds. The receiver interval for the conventional acquisition was 220 feet, with a 12 per geophone array deployed over 100 feet, resulting in 692 stations with 8,304 geophone elements. The Symphony grid utilized a cableless single internal geophone node with a group interval of 55 feet for a total of 5,000 244 single element receiver stations. Earlier we looked at two examples that used a score of four frequency bands over eight source locations. Now with the trend of reducing group intervals and moving towards point source or single vibrator acquisition, we need to be concerned with the signal strength or output of our single vibrator load well sweep. As mentioned, we can adjust the sweep length. However, if we consider the equation Malcolm Lansley proposed in 1992, shown here, we note that the sweep length is inside the square root sign, whereas the number of vibrators in the array is outside the square root sign. We'll see how the symphony accordion method leverages more vibrators as opposed to longer sweep times. For a Permian Basin test, the diagram at the top of the slide shows the geometry for our 10 VP locations. Keep in mind that the set of 10 VPs is spaced out over 220 feet. The schematic for the symphony score is shown at the bottom of the slide. We will shake three different sweeps, sweep S3, an 8 second, 20 to 120 hertz sweep with a single vibrator, sweep S2, a 10 second, 1.5 to 120 hertz sweep with a single vibrator, and sweep S1, a 10 second, 1.5 to 120 hertz sweep with four vibrators. John Archer and I created the following animation to illustrate how the accordion method works. The idea is that we make our best effort to always have a vibrator shaking. As you'll see, the geometry is set up that all four vibrators coalesce to acquire the low dwell sweep, and as such, we don't have to have the long sweep time to maintain our signal strength. This is due to the four vibrators in the array. Subsequently, the vibrators move independently to acquire other sweeps in the score, coming together again at the next S1VP location. Vibrator 1 moves to its sweep location and begins to shake sweep S2. As this is happening, the other vibrators are moving to their programmed locations. When Vibe 1 completes its sweep, vibrator number 2 starts shaking sweep S3. Upon completion, all the vibrators are now in position to shake the 4 vibrator low dwell sweep or sweep S1. When this is completed, vibrators 1 and 2 start to move to their next programmed locations. Meanwhile, vibrators 3 and 4 have started to acquire their sweep sequences and begin moving to their next locations. You'll notice that vibrator number one is now in a position and has started the sequence all over again, acquiring the five VPs to complete the score of 10 source points over the 220 foot interval. To further improve efficiencies, we have also modeled the utilization of multiple fleets of vibrators using this configuration. Here we see a comparison of the legacy 1996 acquisition on the left and the DSA or Symphony acquisition on the right. The Symphony display has been decimated to the same trace count or screen resolution as the legacy dataset. You can see improvements in the resolution and sharpness as well as the continuity of the horizons in both the shallow and deeper parts of the section. On this slide, we have a set of time slices. The legacy 1996 survey shown on the left and the new DSA Symphony survey on the right. The broadband Symphony acquisition shows a definite improvement in the sharpness or resolution of the features shown in these slices. Some conclusions and comments. 
We found distributed source arrays to be an effective method for acquiring broadband data. The data examples show excellent results when compared to conventional full broadband acquisition methods. The method supports various geometries or configurations, as shown by the Symphony Accordion example, and as such can be configured or optimized to our project needs. For fiber size implementations, we require knowledgeable field technicians, as setting up the sweep sequences in the electronics is critical for a successful project. Now, I'm not a processing expert, and as such, I didn't introduce the subject, but suffice to say it's a little more involved with this method and could really be a paper on its own. As for dynamite implementations, we've had some interest in doing a test, but haven't found a suitable project location. I'd like to thank the management at SA Exploration for allowing me the time and resources to put this presentation together. I'd also like to thank my co-author and especially the customers that provided the data examples, Pemex, Beach Energy, and Apache. I'd also like to thank everyone that joined me here today.